My name is Leslie Wood. Uh, I want to acknowledge that as a virtual event, we're physically located in different territories. And the resources that fuel this meeting come from even more territories. Uh, I encourage you to learn about the nation's treaties and responsibilities um, of and to the territory that you're presently located. And the nations who have cared for it and those who reside there now. Personally, I'm on the area known as Tecoronto, which has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It's now home to many uh, First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. And I acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This dish, this territory is subject to the dish with one uh, spoon wampum belt covenant an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. And I know we've got folks from all across these different territories. Uh, I'm so delighted we're gonna be having this discussion today. The idea of this panel is twofold. First, I'm a social movement scholar, I'm an activist, but it's to understand the movement for black lives, to understand it better. Many of us are people who um, study social movements and social change. And this is one of the most powerful and important ones that's shaping the world. And uh, like all movements, it changes as is often misrepresented. Uh, and so we, let's, let's try and work better to understand. Second, this is part of supporting the ongoing efforts against anti-Black racism in our world in our, uh, and in our universities. To this end, this panel is being hosted independently outside of the Congress of Humanities and Social Sciences in solidarity with the Black Canadian Studies Association's decision to withdraw from 2021 Congress. Uh, and we uh, demand that the Federation move beyond more mere words and engage in long-term commitment to dismantling anti-Black racism. I wanna say thanks to York's Anti-Black Racism Initiatives Fund for the support for this event. And particularly, thank you to those who've agreed to participate and attend. We have an incredible opportunity today to learn from and converge with a number of activist, artist, thinker, creator, incredible people involved with this movement who are part of the edited volume. And I hold it up now until we're free. Reflections on Black Lives Matter in Canada. This was edited by Rodney uh, Deverlis, Sandy Hudson, and Cyrus Marcus Ware, who's here today with us. And so this is sort of the plan. Uh, I'm gonna introduce our incredible panelists. Uh, then I'm gonna ask Cyrus, I don't know if you're up for saying a couple words about the book. Yeah, after that. And then I've got a few questions. We're gonna have a discussion-based um, a conversation and then open it up to other folks who are in the room to um, raise their points, observations, questions. Yeah, sound good, yay. All right, so let's start with these um, introductions. Paige Gallat uh, is a Haitian activist and feminist who's been doing anti-racist work for many years in many spaces, including the Canadian labor movement, born in Montreal, raised in London, Ontario, and now living north of 60 in Whitehorse, Yukon, on the traditional territory of the Kwanlin Dun First Nation and the Ta'an Kwakan Council. Columnist for Franco Press. And in her piece from Chichaco to Sourdough, this is in the book, Reflections on Northern Living and Surviving While Being Black, she notes, that's the thing. Black people were everywhere. Even in the smallest towns, in the furthest of lands, in the coldest of winters, we're here and we have been here a long time. Thanks for being here. Dana Inkster is an artist of African descent who has worked in the education and cultural sectors since 95. She recognizes storytelling as the primary tool that shapes our communities and her documentary film work is widely celebrated. Uh, for years, Dana's company has been publishing Lethbridge Living Magazine, and more recently, she's agreed to write the memoir of her 81-year-old father, former commissioner of the RCMP and president of Interpol, Norman Inkster. I think it's going to be fascinating. Her piece in Until We're Free, Blackness in the Atmosphere, speaks about imagining and realizing new work as activist. Its power lies in the potential that when transformational learning occurs, a learner may undergo a shift that directly impacts future experiences. There's a lot there. 
Dr. Cyrus Marcus Ware, recently doctored, uh, is uh, an activist and artist and a core team member of Black Lives Matter Toronto. For 12 years, he was the coordinator of the AGO Youth Program. And uh, from Wikipedia, <laughs> Cyrus sa says, has, Ware has stated that his intent is to dismantle white supremacy within the arts and diversify the museum field. In one piece in the book, a conversation between Cyrus and Giselle Diaz, Nagani, Shoashko, Gokwe, uh, Cyrus says, abolition is, Yes, the closing and ending of our reliance on the prison industrial complex as a way of handling our conflict, but is also an entirely new way of being and relating to each other in the world. And finally, last but not least, Raven Wings is a co-founder of Ilnana Diversity Dance Company and artistic director of OVA Outrageous Victorious Africans Collective a dance theater collective that share the contemporary voices of African, black and queer self-identified storytellers. Wing's vision is to create work art conversations that opens the minds and the hearts of all people and to encourage self-reflection and force fundamental change. In the conversation between Raven and Cyrus in the book, she speaks about a beautiful black renaissance and how she got involved in creating a powerful dance flash mob, which I remember in the middle of the Take Back the Night collaborations in the middle of the street. And she saw how dance could lift people, could infuse people and how in other actions, it could create a space for people to stretch and for people to move and for people to move the violence out of their bodies and out of their personal space. So welcome. Thank you. I'm honored that you're here to have this conversation. All right. I what I I mean what I had so much fun looking at your work and thinking about the ways that you think about movement as something that's very different to the way scholarship often looks at movement as something that's quite a narrow form of politics, a narrow form of protest. So anyway, this comes through in the book this incredible book that you guys are part of. Cyrus, do you wanna say a little bit about this book before we get into questions? Yeah, so we uh, decided that we wanted to create a book that, um, that was created with and by and for community. We wanted uh, community members to have a chance to tell their own stories about what it's been like in this movement for Black Lives and this, in this life in this northern part of Turtle Island and Inuit Nunagat as Black people. You know, we wanted a chance for people from coast to coast to coast to be able to say, hey, this is what's going on right now. You know, one, because uh, there's been a lot written about Black Lives Matter, but uh, not a lot written by people who are actually involved. Uh, two, uh, we know that uh, the kinds of um, conditions facing Black life are, are very real and we wanted a chance for community members to talk about the unique experiences in their particular regionality so that we were hearing stories from people inside prison, people in the Yukon, people who were out in the in the East Coast so that we were hearing of not just Toronto stories and we wanted this book to be a book that was an, a living archive so that the archives aren't just written 30 years after the events happened but actually in real time as the movement is unfolding around us, these people are writing about everything that is happening in the moment. So this is a book that is by community, it's for community, and it's rooted in community. And it tells a story, uh, a particular set of stories about Black life in this moment on this northern part of Turtle Island and in Inuit Nunavut. Oh, and the other thing I would say is that this book, we also chose to draw on speculative fiction. I'm obsessed with speculative fiction as a way to imagine another world being possible. So um, I wrote a speculative fiction story that leads the book uh, as an introduction and also closes the book as an epilogue. Uh, this uh, speculative fiction story that suggests that we survive in the future. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Cyrus. That leads us into our first question, really. It's all connected, of course. But the first question is, what do we need to know about the movement for Black lives in Canada or in this territory, or maybe more generally? And I just, I invite you to 
put up your hand and say what you feel like we need to say. Raven, please. I can jump in first. Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is so exciting to be in conversation with all of you. Um, so when you ask that question, the, the immediate thing come, that comes to me is how it started. Um, a love letter to all Black people about what we deserve um, and, 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 and how to um, action our love for each other in public. Um, this was a call and a response to the violence um, of Black families, um, bringing in a perspective of trans um, leadership, disability justice being centered in this movement. Um, Black Lives Matter is a continuation of the abolition um, that began with our ancestors, uh, elders and forebearers. Um, and the movement itself has expanded um, all over the place to become um, a site for art, a site for activism, a site for conversation um, for, and for possibility. Um, so that's why I believe is important to know about the movement itself. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Cyrus, you have a hand. Yeah, I would just say you know, everything that Raven said and one of the things that's so beautiful about the movement as I'm sort of seeing it grow right now is that it is decidedly queer and trans led and it is decidedly rooted in disability justice. So that we're talking about all of the black people um, that are on the margins that don't always get included in the mainstream conversations about what we're doing and where we're headed. So I'm very thankful that this is a movement that is rooted in intersectionality that is looking at disability justice and trans justice and economic justice as we advocate for better conditions for black lives for black lives to be considered inherently valuable you know it is necessarily rooted in all of this it's also rooted in an intersection and connection with indigenous sovereignty so this movement is one that is connected to indigenous um sovereignty and land back because we know in this movement that our goals are never going to be accomplished uh, under the conditions of a colonial state, you know, and so I'm really interested in this movement as it is right now because it is so fascinating because we're finally at this moment where the political conversation gets to be deep, gets to be multifaceted, gets to really get at the root of the things. Um, so this movement is an exciting movement because it's actually going to the margins and saying, what are the conditions there? You know, Combahee River Collective in 1977 said, you know, when you make the world safer for those who are most marginalized, you're necessarily making the world safer for everyone. And so they said, let's make it safer for Black women. And I would say in 2021, what this movement is trying to do is making the world safer for Black trans women with disabilities. You know, and if we were imagining those people as who we're imagining as, you know, wanting to keep the most safe, everyone else will be safe as a result, right? So I'm really excited that we have trans people leading our movement, that we have disabled people leading our movement, that we have Black and Indigenous relationships and solidarity uh, in our movements, and that is what is going to make this work, and we will we will change the world. So, mm -hmm. well, you are. Yeah, absolutely. I, other folks you want to shape in, jump in of what do we need to know about this movement? I'm kind of curious about how did this happen, but maybe we'll get there. Dana, please. Well, I, I'm so glad Raven and Cyrus are here to speak about the origins of the formal movement, but as someone who identifies as being just a little bit older, like, a, you know, five or 10 years older uh, in terms of activism and transforming communities. In my experience, I was so honored to be included, but I defy anyone to name an institution that has not chewed me up and said, no, thank you. <laughs> but I remain relentless, you know? And my vision for this possibility, I'm so overwhelmed listening to this, origin story of the formal movement of Black Lives Matter is because the insistence that this is happening, you know? I was raised in a way that proximity to whiteness was disguised as agency and it was a lie. 
I was quite old when I figured out that's a lie. I will be in my father's memoir as well. <laughs> but you know, it's it's very, very um inspiring. So with my proximity and the knowledge that I've gained about white supremacy, I can bring that information to building up the possibilities and the longevity of this movement. I just feel so honored to be part of this conversation. Awesome. Thank you, Dana. Paige, please. Yes, I'm going to echo what everyone said because I think it's important and, and very obviously relevant to the question. Um, I'm going to add on to say, obviously, the, the only person from the North on this call is that uh, it is not, and anything surrounding Blackness in Canada is not only uh, a specific to Central, to, to Toronto, to Montreal, as we usually see it in the media, which is my second point is this movement is not a movement given by or tailored by the media. Um, and we don't often critique how much the media um, centers their news for the Marys and the Johns that are going to wake up at 5 a.m. and listen uh, to their morning news or that are, that are gonna listen at 6 p.m. Um, this movement, yes, is made out of love, but our rage is also out of love. And um, finally, this movement for me has been uh, a lot of making what we were told of the, I'm gonna speak as the younger-ish generation because I just turned 30. I'm not young anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, the impossible that we were told uh, is now possible, right? I'm thinking of, I'm from London, Ontario, just this weekend, uh, one of my old teachers was called out um, for uh, performing what is anti-Blackness uh, in London, Ontario, and has been removed as a principal. Uh, and we hear stories upon stories of students, of parents, of co-teachers uh, telling how much they had suffered in the, in the hands of um, not just this specific individual, but other people. And people are saying, oh my goodness, why is this coming out now? They used to be impossible to remove people in those positions of power. Now we are seeing through the movement that it is possible. So it's really exciting for me and I, I'm excited to see what the next generation will be able to make possible as well. Absolutely. Raven, did you have something you wanted to throw in? Oh, oh no, I was just, I was just, I, I, I love this group of um, thought leaders and, and, and folks. And so I was just really inspired by all the different aspects of, of the vastness of, of what the movement is about, our abundance, our, our, our freedom, our liberation, and how that looks vastly different for each and every one of us. Um, and so being able to work interdependently, um, for me from disability justice movements, um, to all lift each other up uh, and to um, hold each other accountable, to maintain safety. Um, we are moving up abolition, so no prisons, uh, no carceral punishments. Um, all of that is an end to all of those systems that, um, that seek to remove the humanity from each other um, and not being able to recognize that in each other. And so we are um, focusing on restoration. We're, we're focusing on truth and reconciliation you know these are really important and necessary pieces of our work um that are that is not indigenous folks jobs to do but ours to um take up and to hold and to um care for um just like that of the land so this is what's coming to me in the moment mm, absolutely the the i you know i'm listening to you think about the things that are particular to this territory, but the things that are also shared and the particular configuration of things that have happened and how things have kind of built the momentum that has built over the last few years. Um, and so, I mean, the question that I had was, you know, how does your work, and we could say your work or this work connect the past struggles uh, and the present struggles I mean, the next question is gonna be about going where we go next, but you can include the future, given that there's a lot of conversation about the future. Yeah, Cyrus, what do you, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, I, and Raven and I talk about this a lot, but we're, you know, this idea of Sankofa, you know, that it is not wrong to go back and pick up that which you've forgotten, 
the idea that this this symbol, the Tenkova, which comes from the Ashanti people in Ghana and West Africa, and there was this Adinkra language, which was the pictorial language, and there's this image, there's actually two images for Tenkova, but one of them is of a goose that is walking forward, but its head is turned and is looking back. And it's this idea that we can learn from the past as a way of imagining and where, where we're going in, in, in the future, you know, and that we need to do that work uh, of looking back uh, as a way of planning for the future. So for me, you know, I'm an activist and I've been an activist for 25 years, you know, so it's a long time to be in the struggle. It's a long time to be in the movement. It's a lot of meetings, <laughs> it's countless rallies, it's a million banners, it's thousands of placard signs, like it's, you know, 25 years is a really long time to be in the movement. And I've been thinking a lot about uh, how the work that I'm doing today, uh, you know, I, I, I could only dream of in 1996, because we talked about abolition then, you know, I was an abolitionist from that moment, and people were so resistant. So the idea that we get to a point where on almost every panel that I speak on, I get to talk about abolition and people nod and say, yeah, that's interesting. I'm interested in having that conversation. It just is, it just is amazing to me. So I'm just thinking uh, just how much this conversation has shifted and grown, but it's connected to that work that we were doing. And that work that we were doing 25 years ago was connected to 500 years of abolitionist struggle, you know? So as abolitionists, we were continuing the work of our ancestors who said, let's abolish slavery, but it just didn't actually finish. The project didn't get finished. It got continued through the prison system and the police system. And so, you know, thinking about um, that this is a trajectory, that I am standing on the shoulders of giants, that my ancestors, you know, who were abolitionists, who said, I want something different for my great-grandchildren, well, I'm their great-grandchildren. I am somebody who is saying for my children's children, I want them to be born free. I want them to be born outside of the system of policing and carceral violence. And so, you know, there's a line, there's a through line of this activism. And I hope that it continues for generations to come until we are all free, which is part of why we called this book what we called it. You know, we are working and struggling until we are all free. Yeah, there definitely seems to be like a stretching out of time, right? And you can see this in so much of the, the cultural movement work that's happening. Uh, it seems very different to where it was a couple of, you know, a couple of decades ago. Yeah. Dana, please. Oh, that was my fingers crossing, but also my mind swirling that, um, in this moment, I I just hope I I just hope that all these possibilities come to fruition. And it's so wonderful to hear a reflection looking back that Cyrus, you see the difference because that is what I'm adopting right now. It's a is a belief that we talk about wanting things to be different, and I feel that when things are different, I will feel it. I don't quite feel it yet. But I know when things are different, they will feel different. And I want to stop paying attention to all the rhetoric and the words and the gathering together is so important, but I want to feel that difference. And I think there's great possibility for that. But what, as a Black person, I hold on to is that my Blackness, in terms of the work that I've made in proximity to institutions, my Blackness is always mine always mine. Mine as an individual person who is unique. And I belong to a community for whom our Blackness belongs to us alone. And together we're stronger. Collectively we're stronger. But I don't ever want to lose um, that in any kind of transactions. I think there's great possibility for this, for this moment in time, as long as we remember our my blackness is mine. You know? And that is a bit of the writing, the, the spirit of the writing that I included in the chapter until we can. Very nice. Yeah. Um, can you repeat the framing of the question for me? Well, it was, it was, how does your work or this work connect past struggles and present struggles? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm a burlesque performer. I'm a dancer, um, and my love language is through movement. And so the way that I 
um, experience the world first is 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 movement <laughs> energy um, based, and so I'm utilizing my body as a vessel to reflect what I'm seeing, and to also um, create new possibilities uh, of what is possible in terms of leadership, in terms of um, agency, um, in terms of what what is strength. Um, the troubling the language of, of what is uh, what strength needs to be <laughs> and look like and sound like. Um, and so all of that is is within my work. I call myself the Black Widow of Burlesque because um, I'm a reminder of what everyone chooses to forget. I, I, I'm a strong believer in this. Um, I am really tired of having to remind people of what they already know. Right, and so my my work and my art is about um, is 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 that reminder. I am that reminder of, of of all the black trans women, all of the sex workers, all of the people who have moved revolutions forward, who have been erased and invisibilized um, for the sake of, of progress and, and proximity to uh, as as Dana talks about to that whiteness, um, to that capitalism. Um, and, and breaking down, um, and, and also sort of breaking apart um, what progress um, is. And for me, it's it's what happened in Africa. It is it is each other being our currency as opposed to the currency of of, of government and money. Um, knowing that we will never find justice or freedom in that institution or any of those institutions that are connected to that. Uh, as Paige talked about the media as well. So um, so that's what I understand my work to be um, as an artist who is an <laughs> artivist. Um, I don't see them as separate things. Um, uh, I Because I come from, we come from um, histories of storytellers um, and they did so through oral tradition, through writing, through pictorial work, through all, these are all the ways that art has, has shifted and changed how we see ourselves, um, how we're represented, um, and how we are in charge of, of telling our own stories, which is why this book is so, and so important. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I wanna come back to what Cyrus said, because Cyrus, I, uh, Every time we talk, I'm like, oh yes, let's keep talking. Something you said about, you know, the project of abolition and how it's not, it's not done. Um, and I'm just thinking about this past weekend and how heavy it's been um, with the with the news of the the remains of the 250 and, and maybe more. I would like to add uh, Indigenous children that have been found um, and the the rhetoric that has been put out of. Well, you know, those were that was the past. We need to move forward. Uh, our work with the RCMP is better now. Our work with the church is better now. Um, these types of rhetoric to, that people don't understand that no, the work is is still ongoing. Actually, the project itself is still ongoing. Blackface is still ongoing. Minstrel shows are still ongoing. They might look different. Uh, they might not be the same way that the media or that history books have captured them, but they're still ongoing. And so, yes, I want to echo that that project of abolition is still ongoing in different ways, different formats. Um, I laughed when Cyrus said the meetings. Oh, my gosh, I'm trying to push back meetings. Um, but also speaking, you know, out of Whitehorse, it can get very lonely when you don't have your community. And I spoke a little bit about that in my chapter of leaving my community and having that privilege to leave. Um, but with, you know, the, with Zoom and with this pandemic that we're in, there has been uh, uh, possibilities to connect. Uh, and I think that's a new way that we're able to, to connect and to grow our movement. Um, something, Dana, when you said blackness is mine, and something I'm constantly thinking of is uh, how we've been shaped and molded to think of what is blackness. Um, and Raven, the way you say you you have to constantly remind people as though they haven't, they don't know, right? As though we haven't said what we are, who we are um, here in the North. I'm constantly having to remind people. I love 
I'm sorry to say I love that there's been a pandemic because there hasn't been any German tourists who have been berating me with questions of, oh my goodness, you're a tourist. Why are you here? Do you love the snow? And I'm like, Black people go camping too. Black people love the snow too. We've been here, like leave us alone. And so yeah, that constant reminder of what Blackness is, according to people who will never be Black, is exhausting. Um, so for me, I think that's that movement is, is that constant working. Um, uh, and at some point, a little bit of what Raven said is, is saying, I'm done reminding you. And uh, now at, after a certain time, you have to face the facts. Um, and the same people that are telling us to move on um, has to not, not move on, but move through, move through us and move through our guidance, through move our movements, move through our love as well, uh, and to figure out how they can navigate their own fragility. And a lot of it has to do with white fragility. Mm. Thank you. I mean, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything. I'm just thinking about, I'm like, is this movement, I know this wasn't on the list of questions we were talking about, but is this movement you think different to other movements? Because it's making me think about all the other movements that I look at and try and understand in its relationship to time, in its relationship to power it is relationship to, between like the manifestation through creativity and struggle um on the one hand i feel like maybe it is unique but then i'm on the other hand i'm like maybe i've just not been understanding movement <laughs> what do you think yeah what i would say to that is all stories are human stories right and so all activism is is the act of fighting for the life that you have um, with all the intersections that you come into this world with and, and are put on you. <laughs> um, and so um, all movements are different. They are different in, in that we are fighting for humanity in different um, cultures, different languages, um, different um, goals. But what is, what is shared um, is uh, a need to be heard. <laughs> a need to be valued, um, a need to be protected. Um, that is what is shared. And that is that is sort of this underlying thing that's come out of co this COVID pandemic period where we're having more conversations about mental health. Um, but I mean, real conversations about mental health. <laughs> I don't mean the those um, the media conversations of like, so, um, you know, are things better? now are things worse now that we're having no like and i don't mean that i mean being able to talk to people about how we can organize and and, and shape our futures um thinking of as cyrus always puts as uh, thinking about disabled people and mad people as desirable states of being um as, as as people who we value are inherently valuable to the fabric of who we are as as as, as people and so um Black Lives Matter is specific because we focus on Black liberation and, and are working in solidarity across the world. Um, you know, with the people of Palestine, um, the people of Colombia, the people, you know, all over, it is, it is so important that we're not just talking about Canada, <laughs> that, you know, these borders are, are, are also a form of white supremacy, right? Like the, it's the way that we, we aren't able to see how we impact each other, you know, the Canadian government and its um, continued um, snakiness around its support for all for Israel, this its continued support for the pipelines that are put through indigenous burial sites. Like these are things that are important for us all to be recognizing. And so in a time period where we're focusing on Black Lives Matter. I hope that it encourages people to do as what you're saying, ask the questions and then find those answers for yourself as to what are the differences? How do you explore them and understand them um, so that you can um, work in concert with the folks? I don't think that people are just allies because they say they are. <laughs> as, as my indigenous elders um, said to me, um, you show up and you are identified as an ally. You don't just come up saying you're an ally we have to, people have to see you doing um, the work. And it doesn't just mean that you have to do it in public. That's kind of ableist, right? Um, there are so many ways to, um, to expand how we connect and how we organize. Um, 
which is also part of this um, time period as well, talking about the ways um, that we are centering disability justice in our workspaces too. How many folks felt like they couldn't say, hey, can I not come into work today? Hey, I'm feeling I'm under the weather. Um, and I mean, like, there's no possible way to get you to, to get you in this meeting. And now we're finding all these possibilities. I don't want to be having that after this pandemic is over. <laughs> you know, um, there are no excuses for, for ways to um, connect and include each other. So that's my, my little rant riff. Love it. Yeah, thanks. Cyrus. Yeah, the only other thing I would add is that what's great about this movement is that it builds on um, an intersectionality that uh, we did see in the civil rights movement and we saw with the Panthers, but it was really squashed because it was the state doesn't want us to have an intersectional conversation. If we talk about anti-Blackness and economic justice and dismantling capitalism, they get really scared. If we talk about Blackness and gender and sexuality and they, they get really scared, they want us to only have these single issues. So in terms of what's different about this movement compared to other movements, this movement has necessarily said, we're gonna talk about all of it. We're gonna talk about all of it. Nothing about us without us, no one left behind. We're gonna make sure that all black people uh, unborderless, like a borderless blackness is, is safe in this world. And that means uh, racialized, uh, the, sorry, that means black, um, uh, queer and trans Black people, that means street involved Black people, that means drug using Black people, that means sex work practicing Black people, that means all Black people. Uh, and this movement has done that. When Martin Luther King tried to bring people together around the idea of race and class during the Poor People's Campaign, the state found it so abhorrent, that's when they really amplified their moves to try to assassinate him ultimately being successful, you know? Uh, and so when we look at the Panthers and when they gathered people in 1971 to rewrite the constitution and they brought in children and they brought in queer people and they brought in women and they brought in all these different com stakeholder communities to rewrite the constitution in an intersectional way that was bringing all of our issues together. Again, that's when the state amplified Kit Cointelpro and really tried to break them apart. So this movement has been a threat to the state because we're doing that work. We're talking about all of it. We're not sticking to, we're not trying to separate out blackness from all of our other experiences of life. And I think that that is what is gonna make this movement ultimately successful. That is how we are going to survive in the future because we're actually finally talking about all of it. And we're gonna be able to undo some of this mess and create a better world. So I'm really thankful that this movement chose to go there and that now we're on this road where we're saying, okay, all boats rise. Let's make sure that we all survive this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's super, it's super interesting. It makes, and, and, it, and of course that's one of the reasons it's hard to capture, which is good, right? By scholars or by the media, like, is it, what, is it winning? Is it losing? Is it rising? Is it falling? Because I think the understanding of power is, um, is much more complex. Yeah. Which also makes it sometimes difficult to figure out strategy and stuff, but that's, that's okay, right? Because strategy is not like a line. <laughs> my sense. Awesome. All right. I mean, the last question I had for folks was, um, where do you see the movement and your work moving next? What are you thinking? Dana? Well, be included in this conversation. My humble ambition is to build new institutions. <laughs> I am so, the fatigue has set in seeking affirmation from these institutions. So three strikes, forget it, 87 strikes, I'm out. I'm gonna build new institutions. It's not rocket science. And I, 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 I hope we can do that together. That's what I wanna do. Pick an new universities, new media outlets, new, like just everything new. That's, that's my ambition. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you have a particular that's one focused. you're starting with? Oh, well, <laughs> I think uh, it would be very meaningful to, uh, you know, I make films and I don't wanna ask for any more grants. I wanna build the production, distribution and exhibition institutions so that we can just do it. And, uh, 
I think it's possible. Yeah. These are not geniuses at the table currently. So <laughs> we will do better if we, if we start anew. But media, I think, is a place to begin. But pick one, pick an institution, you can build a new one. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you see the movement and your work moving next? Anyone want to give us the plan? Okay, um, it's already happening. Um, yeah. it, what we what we want to see is already happening when we understand ourselves as as ancestors, right? Um, and so, what we're doing with Black Lives Matter Canada is that we we are building the Wild Sea Center for Art and Activism, which is uh, comes from the work of Octavia Butler, thinking about ourselves as seeds who are planting um, and growing these. Um, movements of, of change and possibility and freedom and, and no fear. <laughs> um, these, these, these real pieces um, that, that we deserve as, as people. That's what I see um, the movement doing currently. And where I see it going is continuing the work, um, continuing to, to reshape narratives, continu continuing to um, trouble uh, language and, and ideas that we've all, we've, we've inherited <laughs> through white supremacist structures. Um, but I am a believer that just because you inherited white supremacy doesn't actually mean you have to keep it. Um, and so it's a lot of work of decolonizing, um, indigenizing ourselves. And I mean, all indigenous <laughs> people, I mean, you know, African indigeneity as well. Um, we don't talk about all the kinds of ways to be indigenous. Um, and so that's important too, and bring our conversations and, and the wealth of, of ceremony. Um, I would like to see a, a destruction of, of so many institutions and um, a return to learning the land, learning from the land as our, as our teacher, as, as our guiding principle. I'm here in Takadanto. And so this wants food forests, you know, taught elders about sharing community, um, the good oak, the poison oak, like the, these were already here. The land was already providing. Um, and so it's our job to, to return, to work in um, radical reciprocity um, with everything that we're receiving, whether it be um, the information that these wonderful individuals are sharing with you now like what's the reciprocity of hearing the information what are you going to do with that what are you going to um each one teach one um from the black panthers like how are you going to share what you have learned um once you understand it for yourself um and can action that through your body um and i don't mean body in terms of ableism i just mean embodied practice i mean moving out of the theory of um care and actually performing it um, for yourself first and everyone else around you. Um, yeah, that's what I believe the movement is going. Awesome, thank you, Raven. Yeah. Other thoughts? Hey, I'll go after you. Uh, let me hear about the North. Okay, oh, <laughs> all right. Well, um, I'll start by saying it's it's interesting to hear, you know, the the land, what Raven is saying, the land, the land had been providing and uh, having left uh, Tegaronto and coming here on Kwanlin Dun, First Nation uh, and Tan Kuchan territories. Yeah, it, I think the next work is, is preserving the land, <laughs> the land that is here because we know looking down south, we always have the north-south mentality here and we, we kind of shame upon the south because we know it's coming up and we know that the it's it's kind of slowly coming up when we talk about climate justice it isn't just because people are talking about it and because it's flashy it's because it's affecting uh first nations here specifically i'm thinking of the porcupine um the porcupine caribou herd uh that uh the guichin people vanta guichin specifically here in in yukon uh rely on for food um and so seeing that the caribou is is slowly leaving is a huge alarming um uh warning for us uh i i kind of struggle 
with the, the question of where do we move next? Because for me, it's like, there hasn't been a pause. We've constantly been moving. Um, and, you know, for me, it's, it's I'm moving with a movement. It's called a movement for a reason. It's because I, I need to see the guidance of the youth. I need to see that I hear the guidance of the elders um, and the people in the present to continue on. Uh, I'd say also that the movements, you know, there are struggles within the movement that aren't being talked about. Um, and sometimes we, we, we see it or we hear it uh, because we ourselves are confronted by it. And, and I'm thinking, for example, black, uh, black parental and maternal health um, and the epidemic that is, that is happening. Um, I'm thinking specifically, or even movements that have been happening, disability justice has been happening for so long. And I'm always questioning, why are we still not giving platforms uh, to those that deserve it and who's been doing the work for so long and throughout different movements. Um, and my last point is uh, being aware, <laughs> being aware of, uh, and Leslie, your question before was, was are there movements that are different? And, you know, the similarities, being aware of the similarities and the same tools that are used to, uh, to attempt uh, a genocide, to attempt to abolish us, to attempt to squash us. Uh, we are in June, we are in Pride Month, and I always laugh with my fellow queer friends or we're like, ah, oh, here we go again, the banks and the this and the that, and they're coming out, exactly, <laughs> and it's like oh they did the same thing for BLM they did the same thing for the women's movement they do the same thing for you know uh, trans folks they do the same thing for disability folks like gosh we need to be aware of it and at some point we need to say enough enough is enough why is it that it's still happening um and I think before we even go with the big banks and the corporations and I'm not even talking about the injustice systems we need to look at the people who are on our social media and keep them to task how many people are wearing orange yesterday and two days ago and tomorrow we'll forget about the orange right uh how many people have talked about Palestine when Palestine has been a struggle since time uh, so we need to think about these things and, and look at those, not just intersectionalities, but what is being recreated and what are the ways that we could say enough, this is where it stops. And I think finally to add what Dana was saying is creating our own institutions. Yes, absolutely. And making sure that we create it in our way, making sure that we don't recreate the same nonsense to, to, to have lateral violence, for example, making sure that what we're recreating will be sustainable, um, but also will create a new world. Here, here. Absolutely. I mean, I would just sort of echo what has been said. I'm so in synergy with what you're all talking about. I mean, one thing I would say that I, I'm hopeful for, for the movement moving forward is that we learn how to take better care of each other in the organizing, you know? So I think that, that uh, this idea that we take care of us, that we take care of each other, that grows out of disability justice communities that we heard embraced, uh, you know, in 2020, I hope that that actually transforms the conditions of our organizing so that we have more time built into our process so that we can slow down a bit, so that we can um, take care of each other. I hope that we, you know, hopefully when we can gather again, that we have as much time relaxing with each other and enjoying each other's presence as we do on the front line, so that we get to have a whole experience of being embodied with other activists. I hope that this movement forward is one that is crypt. That, 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 that embraces the fact that we can change our timelines, we can change the way that we work to make sure that every body and every mind gets to participate. So I'm really hopeful for that moving forward, that we actually get to be more human in our movements. And that means taking breaks, and that means making mistakes, and that means uh, taking care of each other, and that means working through conflict, and that means all of it that we're actually practicing how we're gonna to be together in the future. That's what I'm really sort of looking forward to and moving towards uh, is this possibility of reimagining the way that we relate to each other. So um, here, here, I hope it, I hope it comes true. You're making me cry. Um, that's absolutely, thank you. Thank you guys. This was some, I think I'm gonna to listen to this a number of times the recording, but I did wanted to invite other folks who are in the room maybe to step into the conversation. It's not a huge group right now, so 
just identify yourself, I guess, and ask or talk. Are there folks who have things they wanted to share? You could also put it in the chat too. Yes, good point. I don't mind speaking. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Abby. I don't know if I should put my camera on, sorry. I was like <laughs> just hanging out to listen today, <laughs> um, but hello. Um, so yeah, my name is Abby. Um, I am currently one of the fellows who's a part of the, um, of the Wild Seed Fellowship. Um, and to attest to like what work is being done now, um, I can 100% agree that part of part of our healing work and part of existing uh, within a time when we have a movement like Black Lives Matter is so pivotal and so important. And I never thought that I would be provided with a space that allows me to just exist and be, and that's good enough. And that is what is asked of us is just to show up and participate or don't participate and just listen <laughs> and, and, and just know that we're, we're still seen. Um, and that is something that has been so helpful and so healing um, in, my, in my gender journey, in my existence, in my blackness, in my existence as somebody who is an artist. Um, in addition to the long list of things I do, and I know Raven will laugh at me for it. <laughs> it's like, you do too much. I'm like, I know, I'm sorry. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but it is absolutely beautiful that we are, we are allowed to have spaces of radical love in the process of dismantling and decolonizing and actively reframing spaces, making that decision to just do it instead of waiting and waiting and waiting. Nothing that we have in this world right now that is in the spaces of injustice spaces, in the spaces that are violent, were actually made for us to actually overcome. It's hard to climb a ladder when there are no rungs to actually fit us on and for us to actually get anywhere on them. So what do you do? You make a next one, you make your own. And like, I get so excited to like share spaces with people, um, whether my mute, and we mentioned before like on social media, whether it's like a small like or a comment or whether it's actively carefully curated um, or just acknowledging folks in the street just to hold space for them. And that just, that feels really, really good. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm very, very grateful to everyone who spends the active time to have these conversations, to be out in the street, to write prose about it um, and to put themselves there because I'm a person who used to do it and I used to engage in all the conversations um, and I used to share all of my opinions on these things and decide like, oh, you know what? This person's wrong for these reasons and I'm gonna tell them about themselves. <laughs> And I got to a place where I'm totally depleted. Um, and so it's nice to also have the reminders that part of being active in this movement is holding space of love, is taking the little bit of the one, two dollars that we get and sharing it with somebody else because while they're out in the street, they're gonna be thirsty, right? And so the being able to play the role of like, a virtual nurturer, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> um, is such a huge, huge honor. Um, and yeah, I'm always, always grateful to folks who have the continual capacity to do this work and to really, really invest their all. Um, even though we weren't really given a choice, but, <laughs> um, but it's still a huge thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Abby. Wow, thanks, Abby. That it, I mean, there, there's so much here that is um, uh, filling my cup, so to speak. Um, these are the things that keep me sustained. You know, the the ideas, the the reflections, the the um, 
you know, something that I really, really focus on when joining Black Lives Matter in 2016 was to make sure that the folks who were inside the team um, were allowing ourselves to have what we were fighting for everyone else to have. So much of the work of activists sometimes is, is about being less important than the movement. And we are the movement, we are the sites, we are, you know, the, the, the project, so to speak. And so um, just that the, those, those reminders are really important um, in, in, in our continuance, you know, we, we must continue, you know, as, as Harriet Tubman reminds us, you know, so um, something that I'm thinking about in this moment is um, we don't all have to do it the same way. I can't say that enough <laughs> because there's so many people who feel like in order to be effective, they have to be loud. In order to be effective, they have to be in front. <laughs> in order to be effective, they have to be the first to do it. Um, all of these things um, are antithetical to the movement, I believe. Uh, you don't have to be first. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. It has already started. You are part of a conversation. And so um, when I think of my activism, I don't actually have an ego. I don't own it. It doesn't belong to solely me. Um, it is ours. It is ours to change and to till and to water um, and to provide sunlight for. All those things um, are, are necessary as we change and we grow. Um, but also rest and also being honest about when it has changed for you. You know, I'm a direct activist right now, but I don't plan on doing that in 10 years. You know what I mean? <laughs> Less than that. But, you know, I don't plan on doing that forever. Um, and so being able to recognize when something is done, when you've done all you can do in a particular area and moving into another area, into a new experience of you have changed, your, your ideas have changed, you have evolved. Um, so many of us feel stuck in place. Um, and so this is an opportunity for us to reimagine how we do it. And so we do that through art, we do that through um, play, we do that through um, parties, through DJ sets, through all, all the different things, through caravana, through, you know, all, all of it is, is a part of um, our legacy too. Joy, <laughs> fun, uh, humor, laughter, um, as well as the grieving. I think that we don't um, collectively grieve together. We collectively rage together, but there's a, there's a, there's a kind of a care that is connected to collective grief. Um, because I don't believe that we should leave our own to grieve alone. I think that we all <laughs> are responsible for each other's um, health and wellness. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm hoping for. Um, to my, my sort of legacy, what I'm offering um, to be. Thanks, Raven. Rana, you have a hand up. Yes, I do. Uh, so uh, sorry, first, I joined only 10 minutes ago. So I know that I missed a lot of uh, very important conversation. And sorry for not putting my video on. I'm not in my private space at the moment. So, but I joined with like already in these five, 10 minutes, I have my mind blown up a lot of very important discussion. So just to introduce myself, I work and I'm engaged and all my dissertation currently, I'm hopefully will finish my dissertation soon is about Palestine solidarity in Toronto, specifically about the BDS. And all what you have discussed are discussions that we always have um, with the activists, uh, whether they are totally engaged with Palestine or with building other coalitions. Uh, uh, Pej, uh, you mentioned something very important, and my question is not only for you, it can be for everyone. Uh, you mentioned about the importance of uh, uh, having our own institutions uh, that are totally independent. We build it ourselves with our own uh, traditions, our own values, etc. So, I wonder whether you are doing something 
everything in the process and what, what do you think about institutions to because sometimes institutions tend to be Oh no, I think I lost part of that. Yeah, Ron, I think your your voice kind of, uh, I think your connection went a little bit off. Can you hear us? Oh no. Oh. Ron, are you still there? You could type it. Uh, yes, sorry, it, it get this. I don't know what was, did you, did you, did you hear my question? Not really. So I was, the beginning, but not the actual question itself. Okay, so so I was specifically asking what Page was mentioning about the importance of building our own institutions, uh, institutions that are not dependent on the government. That it's the grassroots people, activists that are building it, based on our values, our beliefs, our uh, uh, political project, and so on. So uh, my question is: uh, Have you already? Uh, are you already involved in this project? Are you? Clear Creating your own institutions? And if yes, uh, how do you see it a few years down the line? Because there is this belief that institutions are tend to be a bit more rigid than grassroots, and at some time maybe they get disconnected from grassroots. And um, so I'm just trying to think along, uh, like maybe all of us together, how can we build uh, grassroots institutions that really uh, preserve maybe some institutional memory and preserve the really hard work that many people have been doing for years and no need for us to keep doing it, just build on it. Thank you. Uh, I could start, but um, maybe I'll, I'll pass it along to, to other folks, specifically Dana, because you're the one who's, who started the conversation on creating your own institutions. But um, I think a couple things. One, I think we, we need to, to, to open our minds and maybe that's a, and also another way of thinking of institutions and, and not recreating the same things. But institutions doesn't necessarily mean governments, doesn't solely so necessarily mean governments, education, uh, the platforms that we know. Uh, so for example, media is an institution and during the BLM uh, movement in Toronto, uh, myself, but also uh, fellow videographers and photographers, we wanted to show what the movement looked like, not in the same way that uh, media usually does. I'm thinking of platforms such as Al Jazeera, who also have taken, have broken out of the traditional institutions that we need to go through journalism school, then through journalism school, we need to ask these specific questions, then we're gonna get into CBC Globe, blah, 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 blah. we see who are in those institutions. Um, look at who's at the National Post and the certain family that gets to talk about certain things that are, I'm not even gonna mention their names. Um, institutions are also our way of working and interacting with each other. I'm thinking of meetings uh, I'm thinking of the virtual world and how we've already done it, uh, yes, through Zoom, but also how do we hold space, for example, uh, the same space such as healing spaces, uh, such as commemorations, how do we do it virtually? So I think for me, building and rebuild, or not rebuilding, but creating our new institutions also means thinking outside of the box, what hasn't been done, but that will uh, come back to, to our people, uh, to our movement, uh, and that will further push along the goals that we need to see. Um, that's gonna look different. Uh, I'm thinking also of archives, and, and maybe Cyrus, you, you can talk about that, uh, um, but I'm also thinking of a lot of activists who have been saying, we're not gonna wait for you know, national arts centers and galleries to feature our work. Uh, Wild Seed is, is a pure example of we're going to create our own the way we see it fit. We're not gonna recreate, I hope, I don't know, I'm actually speaking on your behalf, but recreating the same workspaces that we haven't been able to get into or that have been toxic. Um, we need to create those spaces for people 
people to know that there is a possibility of leaving those works that we thought we needed to do to succeed, um, to evaluate a different way of, a different way of, of what is success, uh, what is uh, the work, again, that needs to be done. So I think in terms of what's what's been done, it's already there, uh, but it's also, what do you want to see, right? And, and starting with simple things as meetings, um, holding meetings as holding, um, you know, people into account. <laughs> what does that look like as holding space for each other um, and, and so on and so forth. And I know that's probably not the answer you were looking for. Maybe you were looking for a cookie cutter answer. And I guess that's why I'm so happy of my answers because it's not a cookie cutter answer. It is doing that work and, and checking in with uh, various communities of how can we make sure we don't recreate the same cookie um, and do something else. Uh, yeah, I can I can go next unless you want to go first, Dana. I mean, I would just say that yeah, you know, imagine if we were growing uh, these new institutions as if they were growing from seed. Imagine if they were as organic as that. Imagine as if they could uh, have a branch off of a leaf, have a flower. Have imagine if we could actually. Uh, you know, shape change as Octavia Butler encouraged us to do and, you know, prune and, and, and create the kinds of institution that we, that is, that is flexible, that is um, uh, mutable, that, it, that, it, that is able to respond to the moment. One of the things that I study is systems change. And when you look at systems, the world from a systems lens and you see how institutions um, either succeed or don't succeed in moments of change, uh, the ones that are able to adapt and to go with the people often are the ones that are able to continue on into the future. We're saying right now we're going to tear the walls down. You know, we're we're gonna we're gonna need to reimagine from the ground up. We're gonna need to plant new seeds so the you know it, the kinds of institutions that we're building can be as flexible, as creative, as unique as we've ever imagined. They don't have to look like anything we've ever created before. Uh, and there are also, there are also are some organizations and ways of being um, that that come from periods before colonization that we can return to and we can say what are some of the ways that we organized ourselves maybe they weren't called institutions but what were these systems that we used to organize ourselves that we might want to return to so anyways I'm just really looking at this as an organic process that this could be um, like planting a garden where there's just unlimited possibilities of what the shape could look like how many colors, how many scents, how many flowers, we can really create it uh, however we want it to be. And just to add to that, Rana, I really appreciate that question because it, what I do in addition to my creative practice is um, I've used storytelling to participate in fund development. So I raise money for cultural institutions. I have seen for at least 20 years, the ways in which fund development and that it, communities are built around money. C communities to be sustainable require money. I think Canadian institutions at this moment can do better in the principle of stewardship because the danger of building new institutions based on money is that community becomes transactional belonging becomes transactional. And I feel so strongly that Black Lives Matter is a place where the possibility to do better and be more creative as to what that looks like can be. Like I literally have raised in the last decade, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars for cultural institutions. And it's very cookie cutter how that's done. And all the way along, I think of my own blackness about how we can do it better. And it's very simple. And it's about the stewardship of the gifts of people's time. Sometimes it's monetary, but their participation in our ideas and community and possibility, that's what needs to be honored. And I think this is a great moment to, to build new institutions based on that truth. Thank you Great, that. thank you so much. And I'm so happy to keep the discussion going. And we have about 15 more minutes. I see Max has got a question. 
Hi, everyone. I don't know if you can see me now. I turned on awesome. Um, thank you uh, so much for this very interesting panel. Um, I, I love learning from movement leaders. And so thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your, your day. And I think that the, the conversation about building new institutions is, is very interesting. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. Uh, CBC recently has in the last maybe year taken um, I think like in response to the rise in the Black Lives Matter movement has, you know, added some new additional programming. So I'm thinking, for example, uh, the block, which is looking at um, black music specifically, but also um, a new program on black on the prairies. And I just wonder what your thoughts are in terms of like using existing institutions to further movement agendas, as well as maybe a reflection on like some of the potentials or uh, for opportunities or challenges associated with that? So um, thank you for your question. I mean, I think that there are a couple of different ways to look at it. Um, and so the institutions exist, right? We know that they exist. And so there are certain folks who are um, primed to go into those institutions and change them from the inside out. And there are certain people who are not interested in such a thing. And, and I think we need both, actually. <laughs> I think we need the Beyonce's of the world and we need the Nina Simone's of the world. I think we need them, them both because we need to have radical conversations happening that think of institutions as community. I know that community has lost its meaning over time <laughs> through to the suppression and white supremacy, but um, these are ways to organize, these are ways to come together. And so if you think about it like that, that's what I think of as institutions can become for us. Um, but I do think that there is definite merit in, in, in reshaping the narrative and being able to go into these institutions and tell our own stories. And the reason why I say that is because if we don't tell them, they will be told for us. It's happened over and over and over again. This is why this book, Until We Are Free, is so important um, because we are telling our own story. So many stories about the Black Panthers were written not by them, but by people after them. And so we don't know what it was like on the inside, what they had to deal with, what they were dreaming about. We kind of do from the work that they were doing, but really specifically, who was involved? Who were the, who were the players? Who were, who were all the people? Who were they thinking about? Um, and so we stand um, to gain something from from uh, attacking the system from all <laughs> from all areas, um, and so that that that's what I believe. As an artist, as a dancer, as an as an actor who's who's in media, um, I am now in an interesting position because of um, my popularity right now as an activist. Um, I, I am no longer. Um, I'm an abstract artist. I, I come with a whole host of understanding. Oh, this is very wings of Black Lives Matter. So when I'm in a room, the conversation has to change and I make it so um, because I'm usually the only Black trans woman, the only trans person period who's in those rooms. And so I have to make space for us. Um, even if they fire me, they know um, what they're missing. You know, they know what isn't in the conversation, what needs to be included as they talk about these um, proclamations to Black Lives Matter. What I will say is the people who should be profiting off of the movement are the people who are part of the movement. Um, and so institutions will love to um, grab on to the parts of the movement that they like, <laughs> the parts of the movement that they can celebrate, but our job is to make sure that we are highlighting all aspects of our lives, all aspects of our humanities um, at the same time. So, yeah. I Great, thank you. That's, that's okay. um, and I just want to respond really briefly because I uh, guess it was great to see all the. Uh, um, you know, Black in the Prairies. I'm still waiting for Black in the North. <laughs> And, and CBC knows that and it's just like this is great but where does the why is it stopping 
why isn't it ongoing? And why wasn't that a conversation from the get? Why was it a, we're going to test? Um, and for me, that it, it's not a test to see whether or not it's necessary. It's a test to see whether or not white Canadiana is going to respond properly. And if they're going to respond properly, then yes, we will keep it going because the ratings are going up. Um, and, and that's, I think it's, yes, we, we need to, I agree with Raven, we need to be there in all the spaces. If tomorrow CBC calls and says, hey, we're doing Black in the North, are you interested? I'll be like, yes, I want to be there and I want to be part of it. Um, but not just to be part of it and not just to have conversations for my own personal gains, uh, but rather to make sure that it's ongoing and that they know that that work doesn't solely just happen um, for, for Black people, but it needs to happen as a, as, a, uh, as a Canadian corporation, needs to happen not just for CBC and the media, but throughout all Canadian corporations, throughout all organizations, and they need to show and lead the way. Um, I also think we need to be careful with traps. Uh, and traps includes, you know, when they do specific projects, uh, and but their own house is on fire. Um, here in Yukon, specifically, uh, when uh, the, the movement happened in 2020, because the movement did not just happen in 2020, right? And it wasn't just sparked for George Floyd. We need to remember Regis Korchinski Pocket as well, uh, who, who was murdered less than 48 hours later. Um, you know, you know, Christine Genier was one of our uh, morning show hosts uh, and who spoke out and who decided she couldn't take it anymore and had to quit because uh, CBC was, she felt she was muzzled. Um, and so it's really fascinating when we're thinking about objectivity uh, and we're thinking about who do we protect, who do we, you know, who, whose messages are we creating and going out for and for what reasons. Um, and so, you know, I hope that CBC, all of its components, right, not just national, but also in territories and provinces have learned from these mistakes. And yes, it's good to have a diversity coordinator and to have a couple people and they I'm thinking of, you know, Janelle Massa, I'm thinking of uh, Amanda Paris and, and all the people who have been, um, who have been hired, but it's not enough. Uh, and so before we can, you know, reach out to our neighbors, we need to check in our own house. And if our own house is on fire, we need to extinguish that fire. Um, so CBC is not the only one, right? I'm looking at all the other, when I say media, I'm looking at all other media spaces, including grassroots media, such as Rabble, um, who constantly have been called out. Uh, and because we're talking about academia, um, you know, and especially in the sector, I'm looking at all the universities. I'm looking at your York, for example, I'm looking at Glendon, I'm looking at University of Ottawa. Um, there's been so much as a as a columnist, there's been so much to write on, <laughs> which has been great. Um, but at the same time, at whose detriment? And I think that's important to, to recognize as well. Um, so yes, creating our own spaces also means, uh, and our own institution is a form of healing for a lot of us. It's a form of saying enough, we can't take it anymore. This is our space. This is how we heal. Um, and this is how we're, we're able to create and show them, the ones who have the money and the power, how it's supposed to be done. That being said, again, when and if Black in the North happens and my name is not on there, it's a recording, I will be upset and I will talk about it, uh, but I do hope it happens. There is the money, there are the people, um, and forget the ratings. It's important. It's important. It's a form of documentation uh, for our futures as well. And I would just say, you know, I really hope that one of the areas that change happens in and one of the areas in which we uh, we will be reimagining our world as in the arts, you know, because I think that uh, activism and art is tied so intimately together. So is art and scholarship and ac academic pursuits, you know, that, that they're drawing on artists practice so much. Uh, and I think that we need to create, uh, you know, an art sector. Uh, Walida Imarisha says that all activism is speculative arts because we're daring to dream that another world is possible. So, you know, if that's true, then how do we support artists who are dreaming that another world is possible, who are actually painting the pictures and writing the plays and singing the songs and writing the poetry that help us to believe that something else is possible? That, you know, they're not necessarily being supported in the institutions as they currently are, in the granting system as it currently is, in the, you know, artists who talk about politics don't get, you know, picked up in the same way uh, and sometimes are, you know, you know, uh, 
ostracized for talking about white supremacy. So we need to make an art sector that allows creative people to help the rest of the population to imagine a better world, right? So we need to have institutions in the arts that are led by Black and Indigenous people. We need to have institutions in the arts that are rooted in disability justice and queer and trans justice, you know, that are undoing colonial legacies, that are not uh, massive brick and mortar legacy institutions that uh, hold the spoils of war, but rather are arts institutions that inspire creativity and hope for change. So I'm really um, interested in looking at rebuilding all of it, as you say, as we said on the other panel, we need to, there's so much we need to rebuild. Um, but I think we can turn to artists and, and say, how can we support you to help us imagine this future? Because you're literally writing the stories of our future worlds. So how can we support you? I fully, fully agree so completely with what Cyrus has offered. And I think I also agree that in a creative context, art and activism, the joy of being an artist is that you can create new ways of seeing and being. And as someone who's worked inside institutions like the CBC, the National Film Board, the Canada Council for the Arts, there's information to be gleaned. You understand how the sausages are made. And then with that knowledge, you walk out the door and bring it somewhere else and dream new things. So at this uh, stage in my, my life, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I think much as possible. And also to bring others up. If you are inside those institutions and if CBC calls, remember it's about you and it's about three other people that you want to bring along. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. All right. Any last thoughts, words, images? Yeah, please, Cyrus. I just want to say it has just been such an honor to be shoulder to shoulder with the other panelists uh, on this in, in this struggle, you know, to to know that the work that I'm doing here in Toronto is connected to the work that you're doing, Paige, in the north is connected to the work that you're doing, Dana, in the west is connected to the work that you're doing here, Raven and Leslie. You know, as a longtime activist, we've been in in struggles together for decades. I won't say how many, but you know, a while. And you know, it's just so I'm so thankful for the chance to be in this movement with such brilliant change makers who who are really trying to make this world better. I, I mean, I when I'm when I'm on panels like this where we get to talk about, and that was what this book did. When we, when we finally had this book birthed into the world, I was like, oh, maybe we're going to make it, you know? I know we have to believe that we will win. The thought it tells us that. But seeing the stories written out, being on panels like this with all of you, where you're dreaming into the future, I believe that we're going to win. You know, I believe that we're going to make it. I believe that until we are free is actually a short period of time, that the freedom is coming quite quickly. And so I just wanted to say, to all of you, thank you so much for your labor and your activism and your art and your writing and your politics and everything that you're doing that, you know, that that makes me when I get up in the morning know that I'm part of a team and that we're going to do this. Damn it, Cyrus, you're too articulate. <laughs> thank you so much for your generosity and being here today. And I want to um, this is the composting, I guess, <laughs> right? <laughs> that I think will, is reshaping and remaking and making a new world. So I want to thank you all for being here. Thank We're you. going to share this and make it come alive. Yes, okay. thank all of you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for, for growing together, for challenging me to, you know, we need to be able to stay teachable in this movement so you <laughs> to learn you know what i mean it's great thank you so much thank you all thank you and thank you for your questions reina and max yes thank you so much thank you all right we'll stop recording